My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Okay, this session is going to focus on a newly approved fixed drug combination, dolutegravir real pivarine. And this is a medication that is known by the trade name Jaluka. And this is something that is very important to cover today because it is the first fixed drug regimen that has only two drugs that can actually be used for antiretroviral therapy and is FDA approved for a specific indication. It's very important to go over this too so that it does not get confused with our standard drugs that we use for initiating antiretroviral therapy. I do not have any conflicts and the first thing I'd like to do is to go over the specific indication for this medication, dolutegravir real pivarine. Uh, and this is probably the most important points to take away from this entire talk. First of all, the indication for this drug is only to use as a complete regimen to replace a current antiretroviral regimen if an individual has virologic suppression with a viral load that's less than 50 copies um, and this viral suppression has to be for at least six months, and the person has to be on a stable antiretroviral regimen for at least six months. There cannot be any history of treatment failure, and there should not be any resistance that's known to dolutegravir or real pivarine. So the notion is that this is a drug that could be used as maintenance step-down therapy in an individual that has very well-controlled HIV RNA levels. So let me focus on the two components of this drug. Uh, this is actually a pill that is, or tablet that is very small, and the milligram amount of it is very small. The dolutegravir is 50 milligrams, the ropivirine is 25 milligrams. Uh, and if you pay attention to these in terms of pill size, this is a total milligram amount that is very small. So it will be a very small and convenient. A tablet to take. This is dosed one tablet a day with a meal. So to emphasize then the two drugs and their mechanism of action, let's take a look at both the integrase inhibitor and the non-nucleoside. Again, reminding you the integrase inhibitor is going to be working at the point where the virus is trying to integrate into the host DNA. The non-nucleoside is going to be trying to block the conversion of HIV RNA to DNA. So to focus first on the mechanism for the integrase, just to remind everyone, the HIV integrase enzyme is the key enzyme that is involved in the trend, strand transfer of the HIV DNA to the host DNA. The enzyme serves a critical role in opening up at catalytic sites on the enzyme of the host DNA that allows the HIV DNA to be stitched in with some host repair mechanisms that come in and smooth over these patches. The proviral DNA is fully integrated into the host DNA and certainly then can be replicated um, from there on for this cell that has incorporated proviral DNA. The integrase strand transfer inhibitor, in this case dolutegravir, is binding to this critical catalytic domain on the HIV integrase enzyme. And by binding to this, it prevents the strand transfer by preventing the catalytic domain from opening up and splicing open the host DNA. Now, to quickly turn attention to the non-nucleoside ropivirine, this is a completely different mechanism of action that is really focused directly on the key enzyme involved in the host conversion of HIV RNA to DNA, so-called reverse transcription, and the enzyme that's the key enzyme is reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase really serves the role of threading through the HIV RNA DNA hybrid template. Um, and this is where the nucleotides are added on sequentially in an actual very complex process that occurs. The understanding of how the non-nucleosides is somewhat limited but it's believed that the primary role of the non-nucleosides is to bind 
to the actual binding pocket on the non-nucleoside, which is adjacent to the polymerase active site. The polymerase active site is very important as sort of the holding place where the template strand is threaded through uh, on the reverse transcriptase enzyme. The non-nucleosides bind directly into this pocket, and by doing this, it causes two major things to happen that are believed to play a role in the inhibition. First of all, the altered polymerase site occurs in that the threading region is altered such that it really sort of takes the train off the track uh, and prevents the normal threading process. This is also derailed further by a hyperextension of the thumb region of the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And it's believed that these two processes play the major role in, in causing the reverse transcriptase inhibition. Now, let's look at what data we have that is available for this fixed drug combination, dolutegravir and ropivirine. These were uh, presented, but they've not been published. These are the SWORD-1 and SWORD-2 studies. And I should note that when they did these studies, they did not have the fixed drug preparation, so the tablets were actually given as separate dolutegravir and ropivirine. Somewhat complicated study design, but briefly... This was a multinational, it was open label, it was a fairly large trial with more than a thousand individuals enrolled. It was a non-inferiority study where they were looking at this dolutegravir ropivirine two drug combination as a two drug combination for maintenance virologic suppression. As you can see, similar to the criteria for this drug being FDA approved, this was a carefully selected group of individuals. They were on stable three or four drug antiretroviral regimen for at least six months. They had no history of virologic failure. They were, there was no resistance to dolutegravir or ropivirine. It was their first or second regimen. Uh, and key point is, is that they had to have a suppressed viral load for at least 12 months. So very well controlled individuals. And basically what they did is they looked at either continuing on their current three or four drug regimen or switching them. And, and they really had two arms of this. They did an early switch and they did a late switch. Uh, individuals were evaluated in the switch um, in the continue arm at 48 weeks. And if they remain suppressed, they were allowed to go on in the late switch. So looking at the characteristics of the individuals that were enrolled in this uh, trial, it was actually a fairly older population from an HIV perspective. Uh, individuals, the mean age in both groups was 43. Notice that there were about one out of five or 20 percent individuals were female, uh, predominantly white population in this study. I think the key thing is the fifth line down, the CD4 counts in these individuals were high, over 600 in both arms. And notice the mix of the different regimens. Most were on non-nuke regimens, but there was about a quarter of them on PIs. Uh, and, and here there's a, about a 20% that were on an integrase strand transfer inhibitor. Tonofovir was a predominant um, nucleoside backbone uh, regimen in this. And again, most of these people have been on antiretroviral therapy for a long time. You can see the median was above 50 months for both groups. And this is the punchline for what they found. Either switching them to dolutegravir or ropivirine or continuing really had the same impact. 95% of the individuals remain suppressed on this study. And uh, again, this is a fairly large study. This is the combined data for the SWORD-1 and SWORD-2. So in terms of, I think the key parameter that was looked at from a side effect was could you get a little more favorable lipid profile? The total cholesterol was slightly better in the dolutegravir plus ropivirine purple bars. Uh, the LDL actually went up a little bit. HDL went up a little bit higher than the LDL. Triglycerides went down a little bit on the dolutegravir ropivirine. So the net effect from a lipid standpoint was not a lot. But I think you also have to look at the regimens were mixed. Again, non-nukes, PIs, and integrase regimens as baseline. So what the investigators concluded was a switch to a novel once-daily two-drug regimen of dolutegravir plus ropivirine demonstrated high efficacy and was non-inferior to the continuation of current antiretroviral therapy in virologically suppressed 
adults with HIV infection. The safety profile of dolutegravir and rilpivirine were consistent with the respective labels, meaning it was what you would be expecting if these drugs had been used uh, independently uh, in, in, in other regimens. A dolutegravir plus rilpivirine two-drug regimen offers the potential for a reduction in cumulative antiretroviral exposure without an increased risk of virologic failure. So one point that I think has generated some interest is both dolutegravir and rilpivirine inhibit tubular secretion of creatinine through the same mechanism at the so-called OCT2 site, the organic cation transporter 2 site, which is in the proximal tubular region. And this has been known, and the question really would be, if you use these two drugs together, would you have a per prohibitively high uh, inhibition of the tubular secretion and see significant, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 reductions in, in, uh, or in, or sorry, increases in serum creatinine levels. So this is what's been seen now. So dolutegravir, we know from studies, increases serum creatinine by about 0.1 to 0.15 milligram per deciliters. Rilpivirine in studies um, increases about 0.1, so you might be expecting together they might increase 0.2 or 0.25, but in the SWORD studies, interestingly, the combined um, in, in total regimen that was used with dolutegravir and rilpivirine had an increase that was only 0.09. So I think the good news is we're, we're not really likely to see people have 0 0.3, 0 0.4 milligram per deciliter increases in serum creatinine which I think was an important point that could have raised some confusion uh, when this regimen was used. So let me just summarize in what we know about this regimen, how we might envision it, it would be used in clinical practice. So clearly the main use for this should be as a two-drug step-down maintenance regimen, but it's really important to underscore this should only be used in carefully selected individuals people who don't have resistance to rilpivirine or daltegavir, people who have stable regimens, virologic suppression for at least six months. This is not a regimen that we are recommending to start people on for initial antiretroviral therapy. There is no data to recommend or to back that up. There are no uh, DHHH guidelines to back that up, so this should not be used as initial antiretroviral therapy. Again, to remind everybody, this should not be used with the proton pump inhibitor because rilpivirine is part of this regimen. Now, what's the sort of the potential silver lining of a regimen like this? Well, the potential goal for this or advantage with this is that this may turn the page a little bit in our thinking about the potential to use very good two-drug regimens as maintenance-stable regimens in people who have done very well on initial three or four drug regimens, and it is possible there could be, from a national standpoint and from a global standpoint, significant savings if this approach were to be deemed effective. Using two drugs instead of three drugs, um, when you expand that through an entire population, could have major cost savings. The, the other way that I think we might see individuals using this is just simply from a, a, a convenient standpoint of when we're concocting a salvage regimen, we sometimes pull together a regimen that includes dolutegravir and rolpivirine, and this gives us the option now of being able to use this as a single tablet and reduce the pill burden by one pill. But remember that if you have an advanced salvage regimen and you need to bump up the dolutegravir dose to twice a day, uh, the dose of the dolutegravir in this is 50 milligrams. When you have advanced integrase, uh, or you have resistance with integrase inhibitors and you're using a higher dose of dolutegravir, that would be 50 milligrams twice a day. So, so this is not a regimen that by itself would be part of a salvage regimen uh, if there was already integrase resistance. So that's essentially what I wanted to cover for this and just now want to open it up, turn it over to Brian.